Hola, buenas tardes. Retomamos después del almuerzo. Ahora, en este panel, Warren Orba, de la Universidad Francisco Marroquín de Guatemala. Similitudes y diferencias entre el pensamiento de Ludwig von Mises y Ayn Rand. In my opinion, there have been many misunderstandings concerning Mises' ideas by the objectivists and concerning Rand's ideas by the Austrians. Considering that Atlas Rock is human action in fiction, there should be no much difference between their ideas. Both, although using the same words, are using different terms. And I hope to prove that while seemingly saying different things are in fact saying the same thing. So this paper could also be called Coming to Terms Between Mises and Rand on their views on existence, human action, values, rights, government, self-interest, ethics, and altruism. Let me begin with the easy part. Both are realists. They agree that existence of matter, of physical objects, and the world is a fact, perceivable by man, but independent of someone's consciousness, as you can see in Mises' quote. And Rand states that reality is that which exists, that the unreal does not exist, that existence is a self-sufficient primary, and that consciousness, the faculty of perceiving that which exists, depends on the existence of an external world and not the other way around, as you can see in her quote. So, now let's consider the concept of action. Action for Mises is purposive conduct aimed at changing some conditions of his environment that man considers less satisfying for others that he considers more satisfying. Action does not exist without thinking. And you can see that in his quote. And for Rand, it's basically the same thing. Now, let us consider the respective views on values. Mises says that values are subjective. That is, that the subject or person, as acting man in face of alternatives, attaches importance to means and ultimate ends. The value manifests itself only in action, that is, when acting man employs the means to attain his ends. The value of ultimate ends are purely subjective. They are what the person wants to have as his ultimate goal. The values of the means is derivative according to the utility in attaining the ultimate ends, as you can see in Mrs. quote. Rand says pretty much the same thing. When she defines value as that which a person acts to gain and keep in relation to an end, and emphasizing that things as such have no value, but they acquire value significance only in regard to an acting man's goal. And I will read her quote. Value is that which one acts to gain and keep. Value presupposes an answer to the question of value to whom and for what. Material objects as such have neither value nor disvalue. They acquire value significance only in regard to a living being, particularly in regard to serving or hindering mass goals. An ultimate value is that final goal or end to which all lesser goals are the means and it sets the standard by which all lesser goals are elevated. Without an ultimate goal or end, there can be no lesser goals or means. It is only an ultimate goal, an end in itself, that makes the existence of values possible. Metaphysically, life is the only phenomenon that is an end in itself, a value gained and kept by a constant process of action. Now, for praxeology, it is of no importance whether the ultimate end of the subject is life-enhancing or life-destroying, or whether the means chosen are in fact suited to attain his chosen ends. What is important is how man acts, not how man should act. And you can see that in Mises' quote. What is important is to understand that economics is a science, like logic and mathematics, that describes causal relationships. That is, it describes that if certain action is taken, certain consequences will follow. For example, if you eliminate economic calculation, you have no means of making a rational choice between the various alternatives, as you can see in Mrs. Quotes. But on the other hand, if one wants to make a rational choice of the means for the best possible attainment 
of the ultimate end sought, one has to identify correctly the capacity they have to bring about the desired effect, that is, their objective use value. And I will read Mrs. Quote because I consider it very important. Use value in the objective sense is the relation between a thing and the effect it has the capacity to bring about. Subjective use value is not always based on true objective use value. There are things to which a subjective use value is attached because people erroneously believe that they have the power to bring about a desired effect. On the other hand, there are things, things able to produce a desired effect to which no use value is attached because people are ignorant of this fact. So, while economics describes causal relations, politics, because of being a species of prudence, is about practical application of the knowledge provided by economics in choosing means based on true objective use values. That is why, in his book, Liberalism, Mises offers advice on how men should act. He tells us to value reason, because it's the means for intelligent action. And in his quote he says, Liberalism does not say that men always act intelligently, but rather that they ought in their own rightly understood interest, always to act intelligently. And the essence of liberalism is just this, that it wants to have conceded reason in the sphere of social policy, the acceptance that it has conceded to it without dispute in all other spheres of human action. If having been recommended a reasonable, hygienic mode of life by his doctor, someone were to reply, I know that your advice is reasonable, but my feelings, however, for me to follow it, I want to do what is harmful to my health, even though it may be unreasonable. Hardly anybody would regard his conduct as commendable. No matter what we undertake to do in life in order to reach the goal that we have set for ourselves, we endeavor to do it reasonable. And to value freedom, Mrs. tells us, because it means more efficient, efficient the creation of wealth than slavery as you can see in his quote. And he also tells us to value peace because it's a means for the flowering of man. Now, let's consider the question of ethics, which is in what Rand was interested. Ethics is a code of value for the guidance of man's choices and actions. Her intention was to devise a rational, objective, demonstrable answer to the question of why man needs certain code of values. Her answer can easily be described in Mises' terminology. First, one has to establish the ultimate end, whose value is purely subjective, man's life for man. This means a quality of life in which man flourishes, a product of the wealth produced by social cooperation. Next, one has to discover the means that have the power to bring about this quality of life, that is, means which have objective use value. These means are reason which is the means by which one identifies reality, by which one identifies what will enhance or destroy one's life. Second, purpose productive work, which is the means for creating wealth, for sustaining the proper life of man, setting one free from the necessity of having to adjust oneself to one's background, as animals do, enabling one to adjust to, back to the background to oneself. And finally, one's own dignity, which is the means for recognizing one's right to respect, that one is an end in oneself, and not the means for someone else. Hence, that one must live for one's own sake, respecting the dignity of others, that achieving one's own happiness is one's goal. So her answer would be, if you value your life as man for man, the means that have objective use value, that is, the means that in fact have the power to bring about this quality of life, the means you should value are reason, purposeful, productive work, and one's own dignity. This is so because life to exist needs self-sustaining action, and there is a causal relationship between these means and your ultimate end. But if you do not value your life as man by man, then you need no life-enhancing values. So, in Rand's own terms, you see it in the quote, and he says, man has to be man by choice, and it is the task of ethics to teach him how to live like a man. Man must choose his action, values, and goals by the standard of that which is proper to man in order to achieve, maintain, fulfill, and enjoy that ultimate value, that end in itself, which is his own life. 
The three cardinal values of the objectivist ethics, the three values which together are their means to and the realization of one's ultimate value, one's own life, are reason, purpose, and self-esteem. Now, Rand's interest in values is in ethical values and names as objective theory of values that what Mises identifies as the case in which subjective use values are based on true objective use values for attaining what she identifies as the good. The good, she says, is all that which is proper to the life of a rational being. The bad is all that which is destroys it. This definition is based on Aristotle's definition, the good of each thing is surely what preserves it. Now, the question is, why, if it seems that her theory of value is so much alike to that of Mises, did there arouse so much controversy? Well, there's a good reason. Because both employ a term that is equivocal if one does not distinguish what each means by the same word, that is, if one does sees the context. The word is subjective. For Mises, subjective means, in this case, that the value exists in the mind, that it belongs to the thinking subject, to the person. For Rand, subjective means the arbitrary, the irrational, the blindly emotional. So having in mind these different terms, let us examine what Rand says about her objective theory of value. And you have it here in the quote. Intrinsic theory holds that the good resides in some sort of reality, independent of man's consciousness. The subjective theory holds that the good resides in man's consciousness, independent of reality. The objectivist theory holds that the good is neither an attribute of things in themselves, nor of man's emotional states, but an evaluation of the facts of reality by man's consciousness according to a rational standard of value. Rational in this context means derived from the facts of reality and validated by a process of reason. The objective theory holds that the good is an aspect of reality in relation to man, and that it must be discovered, not invented by man. It seems to me that this theory does not contradict what Mises says, he agrees that value is not intrinsic. It is not in things. He also agrees that the good or utility is determined by an evaluation of the facts of reality by man's consciousness according to a rational standard of value, that the means are valued derivatively according to their true service and laws in contributing to the attainment of ultimate ends, that the objective use value of something must be discovered before this something is valued, and finally that arbitrary or irrational valuation will not contribute to the well-being of man. Now, as you can see, now, both thinkers consider that rights are not natural, nor God-given or society-given, but a moral principle for the function of society. And society, Mises tells us, is joint action and cooperation of individuals in which each participant sees the other's partner's success as a means for the attainment of his own. Mises, as well as Rand, considers that the correct system of ethics is to be based on the nature of man and his life. And he says that this ethics is a metaphysical necessity of man's survival. An egoistic, in the right sense, prudential ethics that guides man's actions to live a pleasant life. And I quote Mises. Nothing is gained when the teacher of moral constructs an absolute ethics without reference to the nature of man and his life. The declamation of philosophers cannot alter the fact that life strives to live itself out, that the living being seeks pleasure and avoids pain. All one's scruples against acknowledging this as the basic law of human action fall away as soon as the fundamental principle of social cooperation is recognized. That everyone lives and wishes to live primarily for himself, does not disturb social life, but promotes it. For a higher fulfillment of the individual life is possibly only in and through society. That is the true meaning of the doctrine that egoism is the basic law of society. And Rand stresses this character of morality when she says the purpose of morality is to teach you not to suffer and die, but to enjoy yourself and live. An important point that Mises said in the above quotation, and then one must not oversee, is the fact that egoism is the basic law of society. Egoism, in this context, is to act for one's own rightly understood interest, always to act intelligently, to act in order to achieve one's happiness along one's lifespan. In one's relationship with others, this means acting benevolently, so that one builds a relationship based on goodwill, because it is in one's self-interest not to initiate force to others. 
they will retaliate. Because it is in one's self-interest to cooperate, one's life will be enhanced by the creation of wealth. And because it is in one's self-interest to cultivate friendships, it makes life more enjoyable. It is the application to ethics of the creator's principle of a win-win situation, exchanging value for value. That is why the market promotes goodwill, peace, and cooperation. And this is the reason why Rand denounces altruism as an evil moral cause. Now, for most people this sounds, at best, strange, because one has been taught that altruism is useful devotion for the welfare of others. But let's stop to analyze this theory for a moment. Altruism is the name Ocus Comte gave to his moral system, which he presented in his Catechism of Positive Religion, and basically consists on the principle of living for others. Here, he explicitly states that the individual has no right to his life, no right to his property, nor to his liberty. His system is opposed to individualism and affirms that man has only duties to others, those that lived, live, and will live. And I will read his quote because it's so important. Positivism never admits anything but duties of all to all for its persistently social point of view cannot tolerate the notion of right, constantly based on individualism. We are born loaded with obligations of every kind to our predecessors, to our successors, to our contemporaries. Later, they only grow to accumulate before we can return any service. On what human foundation then could rest the idea of right, which in recent should imply some previous efficiency? Whatever may be our efforts, the longest life, well employed, will never enable us to pay back but an impersonally part of what we have received. All human rights then are as absurd as they are immoral. I will repeat this. All human rights then are as absurd as they are immoral. As the divine right will no longer exist, the notion must pass completely away as, relate, as relating solely to the preliminary state and directly incompatible, incompatible with the final state which admits only duties as a consequence of functions. Now, how can such a system be benevolent? How can the idea that one is practically a slave of others be good? How can the idea that in order for someone to flourish, others must suffer be the epitome of goodness? And remember, this is Comte, not Obama. <laughs> this is the concept of a win-lose situation applied to ethics. It presupposes that the good consists in hurting yourself to benefit others. It's a zero-sum game. This is the mentality that can only conceive egoism as hurting others in order to benefit oneself. They cannot conceive of a third alternative, nor in ethics or in economics. This attitude will not lead to social cooperation, but quite the contrary, to social cannibalism as we have witnessed in the socialist regimes. Individuals are sacrificed for the state, for the common good, for whatever is used those in power can figure out. It certainly will not promote love for others if one sees other, the other as having a claim on one's life. Let's see what Mises thought about Comte. You have it there on the, on, on the quote. And he says, that Comte can be extubated, as he was insane in the full sense with pathology attached to this term. But he asked a fundamental question. But what about his followers? Yes. And what about his followers? Can they be extubated? And what did Rand say about altruism? She said, do not confuse altruism with kindness, goodwill, or respect for the rights of others. These are not primaries, but consequences, which in fact altruism makes impossible. Capitalism and altruism are incompatible. They are philosophical opposites. They cannot coexist in the same man or in the same society. And of course this is so, because capitalism is based on respecting individual rights. And altruism is based on saying that there are no individual rights. So they cannot be compatible. So if the basis of society is the law of egoism, as Mises said, that means that society must be organized upon an egoistic moral principle. 
a principle that invites everyone to associate because it will promote his well-being. This moral principle is the concept of right. Mises also tells us in human action that liberalism as a political doctrine is not neutral with regard to values and ultimate ends sought by action. Presupposing that individuals prefer life to death, health to sickness, nourishment to starvation, abundance to poverty, happiness to suffering, indicates man how to act in accordance to these valuations. And he says, the teaching of utilitarian philosophy and classical economics have nothing at all to do with the doctrine of natural right. With them, the only point that matters is social utility. They recommend popular government, private property, tolerance, and freedom, not because they are natural and just, but because they are beneficial. And Rand has a similar position. She says, rights are a moral concept, the concept that provides a logical transition from the principal guidance and individual's action to the principal guidance his relationship with others, the concept that preserves and protects individual morality in a social context, the link between the moral code of a man and the legal code of society, between ethics and politics. Individual rights are the means of subordinating society to moral law. To finish, let's examine what they thought about the role of government. Mises said that the only task of the state is to protect the life, health, and private property of its citizens. And I quote, as the liberal sees it, it is the task of the state consists solely and exclusively in guaranteeing the protection of life, health, liberty, and private property against violent attack. Everything that goes beyond this is an evil. A government that, instead of fulfilling this task, sought to go so far as actually to infringe on personal security of life and health, freedom, and property would, of course, be altogether bad. And Rand said pretty much the same thing. The only proper purpose of a government is to protect man's rights, which means to protect him from physical violence, and a proper government is only a policeman, acting as an agent of man's self-defense. And as such, man resorts to force only against those who starts the use of force. So, at the end, it seems to me that what both authors are say about existence, human values, rights, self-interest, ethics, altruism, and government are pretty much the same, although they say it differently. So what do you think?